Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us again. I told you that we were going to do a part two of the part four of seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons, if you will. We wasn't able to cover a lot on the Sunday services. Today is Monday. This is pre-recorded, so um, I hope that you're joining and trying to keep up with these series and hopefully that they're being edifying to you. Uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead expeditiously get into our uh, continuation of this study. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and just start at where we've been coming from, our base scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says in the first verse, um, and I'm going to just do like I did um, Sunday uh, when you came to this, uh, the study here or this message. I'm going to read from the first to the second verse. It says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter, speaks expressly in a latter time. Some shall dart, depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons or devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. A hot iron talks about um, uh, or denotes uh, reprobate. So <clears throat> we, we, we're going to go back to Ezekiel. We wasn't able to make it back Sunday, but we're going to go ahead and read again. We're going to start from there as well, and we're going to cover quite a few scriptures to try to build up on a, um, a, 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 a fact of why it's so important to really learn and understand the word in the right context, as we were speaking of. That refers to faith. It refers to love. It refers to judgment. It refers to everything that the word concerns uh, humankind, whether it be wrath, whether it be uh, holiness, whether it be righteousness, and so forth, and etc. So just, just hang in there with us. It's a little uh, tedious, but I suspect that you would agree that it's absolutely necessary and crucial. So go with us to Ezekiel chapter 13, if you will. <clears throat> I'm not going to read all this as we did Sunday. We're going to come back to it. I'm going to just go ahead and start from the 6th verse and read down to the ninth verse. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying the Lord said, and the Lord has not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. And if you notice this, the, the com word confirm the word or confirmation is uh, much used in today's modern church. And it's not a bad word. But oftentimes, the, the effort to confirm the word has nothing to do with it being a reality that God has uh, given. And what I mean by that, I'm going to read the divination. I mean, uh, uh, the notes here. It says, they have seen vanity and lying divinations means, means that they have believed their own lies and have tried to confirm their own predictions. And this is, this is what's going on in most corners, in most churches they're trying to confirm, uh, confirm their own predictions or their own uh, lies or perception, perceptions. You understand what we're saying? And it says that they did by claiming the Lord said when in fact the Lord has not sent them and have not said anything to them. And this, this, this is a very sobering uh, scripture for me and for all those who are genuinely trying to be led of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to say something the Lord hadn't said in uh that's why it's absolutely uh, important, and, and there's no other safe haven than that to take God's word at face value and stick with the word. If it doesn't say certain things and, and people are trying to project it and you hadn't found that to be true in the scripture, uh, flush it out. Put, away, put it away. It's toxic. You understand what we're saying? And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to stick with what the word says and how it says it in context. So hope that makes sense to you. Seven verse, have you not seen vain visions and have not spoken a lying divinations, wherein you say the Lord said it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus said the Lord, because you have spoken vanity, and notice vanity is right in front of it, vanity, and seen lies. Therefore, behold, I am against you, said the Lord God. My hand shall be upon the prophets and who seek vanity and who divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written, and uh, neither shall they be written in writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and you should know that I am the Lord God. Okay. If you will bow your head with me for a moment, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you again for this 
uh, opportunity and privilege to preach and teach your word. I ask that you guide me and lead us uh, that we might be in harmony with your will that of one mind and one faith and that it might be that which brings glory to the body, bring glory to your name and brings edification to the body of Christ. Father, I thank you that because of you, because of the revelation of Christ and the moving of your spirit, that we're able to walk in clarity and have full, complete dominion over that which is contrary to your word, to your will. And we ask that you help us to walk in a total and complete illumination of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> The base, I keep repeating this, the great lie, the base foundation of the great lie or what the great lie is of doctrines of demons or seducing spirits is that you can go forward or you or I or whoever can live this life without... Um, Dependence on the Lord or dependence on God. Th this is the great lie. I mean, you have the lie that the world, uh, for the most part, adopts is that there is no God or that he's not concerned with the affairs of men. And then you also have that life can be lived without God. You can pursue happiness, joy, commitments, and so forth. And you don't, or we don't need God as the, the glue or the centerpiece or the instructor. And, and it, again, it's, it's all based off of that great lie <clears throat> that life can be lived without God. That, that started in the Garden of Eden, that you can get wisdom without God. You look at the foundation. Satan, as he rebelled against God and the angels that went with him, uh, felt like they can live their existence without God. And it is foolish and foolish indeed. But multitudes and multitudes of millions and billions of people enter into that domain of divination. They're enchanted by uh, self-preservation, self-centeredness. You know, we always talk about selfishness, but selfishness is just another term of saying just centered upon self, preoccupied with self-interest making self-interest our highest priority. This is the, 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 the uh, Achilles heel to many Christians. Jeremiah, if you will, Jeremiah chapter uh, 10. <clears throat> and this one of the things I wasn't able to get to that we're going to continue to hammer in on because we got to deal with what is the dox doctrine of demons. Is, you know, being, you know, we talk about pride. You know, I've, I've heard Jimmy Swagger, heard other theologians and other people along the years and even now say pride is the crowning joy of the fall of the devil. And that's true, but it needs to be walked through because most people don't realize that uh, pride is, if you will, another word uh, for the expression of self-centeredness, self Exaltation again. We've given that uh, definition before. Is intoxicated with the exaggeration of one's own importance. That's pride. An intoxicated person with an exaggeration of one's own importance. Self-exaltation is a result. Self-worship and making self the highest preference or priority. Think of that. And that's what that's where we get the sin nature, and it is it was so powerful when it 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 cut us off from the life source that it was so powerful that it affected our DNA, and that's the truth. It did affect our natural natural body as well, but the natural body is not actually the, if you will, the the foundation for sin. It's just the effect of sin. The natural body if experiences the effect of sin, and, and, and you can't argue that. That's why we have diseases. That's why we have birth defects. That's why we have all kinds of things. So even when people go in to say, well, I was born a certain way, I was born with a certain proclivity, and so forth and so on, even so, if you want to make that argument, no one celebrates a handicap. 
No one celebrates a deformity. So even if you want to make that argument, the argument that I was born this way, the reason that argument is made because the, if a person is making it, because their defect or whatever they think they've been born with is unique. It stands out against what is normal. So if it's standing out what is norm against what is normal, then in and of itself says it's nothing to be celebrated. It's time to look for a cure. So when when man fell, his his DNA was infected. I don't buy this. I was born a homosexual. I was born this and that. But even if you want to make that argument, when you want to look for a cure, the simple fact that these things that are are contrary to life is an evidence of itself that it needs to be remedied. It needs to be dealt with. Not condemning people, not saying that the person who, who's struggling with these proclivities uh, doesn't have a, a chance to get to heaven or God doesn't love them, but God's love is never in question. People always make the argument, well, God loves me just how I am. No, that's not true. God loves you in spite of how you are. <laughs> you know, that's the argument. But the, the, his love is never an argument, though. He loves us in spite of it. Our love for God is always in question. You know, that's why it's always one-sided when people make the argument, well, God knows my heart. Well, do you know your heart? Do you understand what's going on? Because if you really believe God knows your heart, why don't you take his point of view of it? His point of view is, let's look at what his point of view is. I said to go to Jeremiah. Let me, first, let's look at that first. Jeremiah chapter 10, 23rd verse. <clears throat> 23rd, 24th verse. I remember, I said the great lie is that of doctrines of demons and seducing spirits is that you can live this life without God. And that needs definitely uh, explanation. It, it really needs to be exergeed in a greater way. We won't have time to do it today. But uh, it says, oh, Lord, I know. Now, he says, I know that the way of a man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Now, look at that scripture. So he's not speculating or guessing. He said, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Well, this is not conflictive with choices. What it's saying is, in simple terms, that even though we have the ability to choose the way we live, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we go about business as usual, but to get to the final conclusion of your existence doesn't exist in you. It has to be revealed to you. The conclusion of our existence is not just to live, breathe, eat, and die. The, the conclusion to our existence is to know and serve the living God. Amen. The 24th verse says, oh, Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in your anger. At least you bring me to nothing. So if man is a spiritual being tied to his creator, who is God. Without direction that only God can give, Man, this positive study note, which is I think is wonderful, man wanders helplessly. Who's, who, uh, however, man is low to admit such. So without God, they are just wandering helplessly. That's why people are always looking for a purpose, always looking for a pick-me-up, always looking for a fix, because they're not trying to uh, stay connected or find how to be connected with his creator. You understand what we're saying? Um, <clears throat> man cannot uh, honestly l uh, live this life and think that because he has embraced the idea that he doesn't need God or that God is not it, uh, doesn't exist, he, he's, he's not willing to admit, if he, even if he doesn't say it out loud, he's not willing to admit that all the evidence uh, it's in contradiction to what he's embracing. When man said God doesn't exist, he's, he's actually inwardly lying to himself. Now, he might eventually buy into that lie, but there's a lot of evidence that proves that man should know because he's self-aware 
and that he has a certain amount of awareness that not even the beast of the field have, that he should know that God does exist. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you want me to give you a little bit more on this thought so we can move forward, go to Solomon, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes. Go to Cle Ecclesiastes with me. Now, some of you may argue, well, of course, if you're reading for the Bible, it's going to say all those things, but who, who's to say that that Bible is true? What's the difference between that belief? And I know that we're probably talking to an audience at this stage because we have, have a small listening audience that most of you already know this. You already accept God to be real. And so, you know, it might seem like a useless argument to make statements that may apply to people who might come along who don't uh, know the word or don't accept God, but it's never a useless argument because you never know who's going to tune in. And on top of that, sometimes our own reality as believers need to be put in check. So it's never a vain effort to reinforce uh, the reality that we're now living in, that we embrace. I hope that makes sense to you. Ecclesiastics chapter 12, if you will. And just for the sake of time, I'm just going to um, read the, uh, the, third, the, uh, the 12th verse. I start from the 12th verse to the 14th verse. And further, by these, my son, be admonished in making man many books there is no end, and much study is weariness of the flesh. And, and what this means in the note says this, in which I think is good notes. Human writings, however numerous, lead nowhere and only produce weariness. There's a scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I think Sister Jeffrey even quoted here recently, um, Deacon Jeffrey as well, that ever learning but ne never able to come into the knowledge of the truth. So you have that same language being spoken here. You've got all these books being written about God or about other subjects but they only add up to uh, weariness. They don't, they don't refresh. You understand? They, 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 they just uh, cause weariness. They produce weariness. The divine writings of, uh, that leads to Christ and to heaven, they are the words of the light. They refresh and they do not weary. When you see Christians who cannot st stand under or sit under the onslaught of a thorough ministry that's teaching the word, that's trying to do the breakdown, when you find yourself, find yourself weary, oftentimes, I'm not saying that we don't have physical fatigue, so I'm bringing a balance to it, but I'm saying when you see people who just seem to be annoyed with the word being brought forth, it's not an indictment against the minister or the preacher or the church. It's an indictment against that particular soul who only has a diet of earthly, seductive, demon-like things. When you have that kind of diet, you, you know, it's hard to stop eating fast food when that's your constant diet. When you have to really, you can go to the doctor and they say, well, you need to stop eating this and causing clog arteries and other things you might have. Uh, kind of diseases, heart attack, stroke, you know, all kinds of things can happen to you. Even bad news about the risk and potential of death can't really deliver that person from a bad diet. That individual has to recognize and be receptive to the importance of their own health before they can make a change in their diet. And I bear witness of that in the physical. So it, it's just that much more important spiritually. If you consume all the things that contradict reality as it relates to God, then it's hard to sit under a ministry that's actually trying to bring forth the diet of learning truth, the learning Christ. Because you have no appetite for it. And, it, and the thing about it, the bad stuff is actually the uh, acquired taste. When you actually think about it, it, I hate to say it this way, alcohol or drugs or, you know, stuff that's really, really bad for you, they never really taste great. 
you have to, your body, the chemical had to actually get in you to actually create a chemical dependency. You follow me? The, at the taste, and then after, after a while, you do have acquired taste because it's amazing how the body, I know I'm getting into the weeds on this, but it's amazing how the body, when it becomes dependent on, that, chemistry, on that, that chemical, that toxin, it creates a desire to consume it. False doctrine to the world is, is something that, that um, how do I put this? It's something that is not just a, a bent towards um, um, deception, but it also requires, it also requires an adaptive appetite. Does that make sense? We're born deceived, but, but you still have to require or acquire a, a, a desired appetite for it. That's why David said, I was shaping iniquity. The, the, that's why the devil comes out, because he knows if he doesn't continue to produce endorsement of self-deception, you will find the truth in this matrix of lies. Amen. So he has to try to create that deception from birth. And that, that cycle starts with your family. It starts with your environment. You see it? Even though we're born with deception, we're born with the sin nature. I'm trying to clear it up and make sure you understand what I'm saying. But the truth is actually refreshing. Is we're, we're actually made to receive truth. We were never created to have an appetite or a diet of deceit. Amen. So since the fall, you follow me? Since the fall, we had that cancer in us, but it's not something that we were made to digest or to embrace. So the Satan's on his job in making sure we get inundated with that. And so when the truth comes around and you really begin to realize the toxics and the physician then told you this is going to kill you, it's going to cause a heart attack, you got clogged arteries, you got inflammation in your mind, when you realize that and you say, okay, I don't want to die, I want to live, I really see my health is, is important. Right. The deception begins to lose in enchantment right. because there's an enchantment to deception. And that's what the doctrines of demons do. You can, all the love songs, all the music that the world plays, notice it all catered around to having happiness and joy and love without God. Amen. Am I right on that? Amen. Amen. So this is what the scripture says in the 13th verse. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. If you read Ecclesiastes, he talks about vanity and vexation of the spirit and so forth and so on. And at the end of this, Solomon says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Listen to that. Fear God. Reverence God. Have enough reverence and respect for God to shake you from the illusion, to rattle you from the illusion. Man, that's powerful. And keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. And see, this will trip a lot of people up when you don't have the context. Keep his commandments. We know according to the scriptures, both old and new, that no man humanly on this planet, aside from Christ himself, were able or are able to keep the commandments of God. So is God contradicting himself when he said keep his commandments? He's not. They in the old were to look towards the one who will come to fulfill it. We in the new look back to the one who did fulfill it. And because you are in him and trusting in him and that relationship with him and God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is operating off love, the commandment is kept perfectly. Amen. Which thereby is the application of your faith, which is perception. You see it? That's the application. This, and, and we can prove this to be true. Keep the whole commandment of God, for this is the whole duty. He said this is the whole duty of man. This is the whole collusion, collu uh, uh, conclusion. And it said, for God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or 
whether it be evil. All this needs to be broken down, whether it be good and evil. Outside of Christ being the context of your life, it's evil. Outside of, uh, of truth, it's evil. Outside of God's perception, it's evil. You understand? Outside of being in harmony with what his word says, it's evil. And But man will call good evil and evil good. That's why I don't go with the cross being the object of my faith because the Bible doesn't say that. But it does tell us that through his sacrifice we are sanctified. It does tell us when Paul mentions the cross, you can rest assured Paul used the word cross as a point of reference. If he did any otherwise, then this whole Bible comes unraveled. And that's, this is a part of why I'm ministering this because seductive spirits are more subtle sometimes than we believe. And I'm trying to validate the point. You can't go outside the word. And some people would f flinch at this because they bought into it as I have hook, line, and sinker. You understand? Bought into this idea that faith in the cross and Christ equals victory over sin. Well, that's only true if the context is in place. And you got to be very careful. It's not that the, using the word cross is wrong if it's in the right context context and the only way to assure that it's in the context I know I keep uh, raging this battle against this doctrine because it's, to me it's one of the subtles and I don't think people meant any harm when they started doing it originally but the reason we raged the battle against this because it's, a, it's an enchantment to it it's a seductiveness it's a Trojan horse when you think it through Christ is and his sacrifice is the reason, as most people would agree, is the reason we have all that we have. But it wasn't Paul saying, go to the cross now. Because if he did that, look, look, look what I'm about to show you. Go to, um, go to St. John. Let me show you why this would be a lot more problems than realized. Let me go. Let me go get there myself. Got a lot to do. Y'all still with me? Talking about the difference between false and true. Most people won't give this a shot, uh, a chance to listen to, especially if it comes against their favorite preachers and their favorite uh, theologies and so forth and so on. And that, and be frankly with you, and I don't mean this in a mean way. That's really not my problem. But if you're really paying attention and you're really interested in the truth. All you have to do is check us with the scripture. Let me let me validate this for you. Uh, several scriptures. I got a lot to do. <clears throat> I'm running out of time real swiftly. I'm looking for. I'm trying to remember where it was. What Jesus says, if I be lifted up. Uh, Saint John. I know we gotta go back to. Anyone know where it is? Saint John. I got it. Saint John chapter twelve. I'm going to move through this real quick. St. John chapter 12, 32 verse. Put that up, Jared. Hold it for a minute. St. John chapter 12, 32 verse. So I know I've done this before, but I'm going to reinforce this. Because we're talking about doctrines of demons and seducing spirits. When anything takes us out of the context of Jesus being at the center of it all and his person and his sacrifice himself, his sacrifice himself was to reinforce us to evaluate his person. Let me repeat this again now. The sacrifice, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ was to stimulate for the believer a, a great evaluation of the person. That's why I said behold the lamb, examine the lamb. The sacrifice is the pinnacle point as, as for us to realize he was willing to die that we might live. The sacrifice was to represent to us that when he died for us, he not only brought us back to God, but he was actually giving us the principle. Listen, his, his literal death, think about it, was actually laying out the pattern, the principle, by which we're to uh, uh, align ourselves with trusting God. It was to show us this is how you trust. It's not, not just why you trust him. This is how you trust him. This is, and what that means is he's saying, I want all of yourself to realize that this is what God is saying to us. I want all of yourself to realize that you can give um, your, your body, as Paul said, your body to burn. You can give to the poor. But if you don't accept my perception, 
If you don't trust my perception, that's what it means to uh, when Christ died on the cross. He says, I accept the perception of God. I'm trusting the perception of the Father, and I'm going to apply that by presenting my body. Paul was talking about that in Romans chapter 12. I'm going to apply that by presenting my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God. When Christ died on the cross, he laid out a pattern. This is how you live. You realize that you're not going to walk through this world, this journey, by your own perception. If it's possible, let this cup pass for me. But nevertheless, not my will, let your will be done. Jesus accepted the fact that if he was going to die for his bride, he was going to have to embrace God's perception on this thing. This is how I want you to get your bride. I'm going to pull her out of your side. I'm going to bring her out of your side as I did the first Adam. I, I, I laid him down and I brought him her out of his side. When you die on the cross, I'm going to bring her out of your side. Thus, blood and water. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And cleansed by the water of God's word. So I'm laying out a pattern on how you apply your faith. I did not know that. So when he died on the cross, Christ must remain the context. Proof of scripture. Not hoping to confirm the word, but the word confirms itself. As we go back to Ezekiel, John chapter 12, 32 verse, St. John chapter 12, 32 verse, what he says. And I, if I, be lifted up hmm, from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So when Paul mentioned the cross, he was not pointing people to the cross. He was using the cross as a point of reference to point to Christ. Because Christ already given the foundation of the purpose of the death. I will draw all men to me. Come on, y'all. Ain't that powerful? Isn't that not powerful? I will draw all men to me. The cross, dying on the cross is a point of reference to me. The devils are doctors of demons. They knew they couldn't stop this. So they 2,000 years ago, Later, they're going to get more aggressive, so they're going to start actually using the cross or using denomination or using even biblical concepts that are true in and of themselves, but outside the context, they only create veil around the mind. I'm going to prove that. If, they, if it's out of context, there's going to be a blind spot. There's going to be a, bl a, a veil on the mind and the heart. If When it leaves Christ... Or it, Christ is entwined with something else. You're going to be blindsided. It should always lead back to him. And, and the scripture goes on and says, this he said, signifying what death he should die. So Christ actually says, this is the death I'm going to die. Right? Okay, so St. John chapter 3, 6, 15. Everybody familiar with this scripture? Let me move faster. Y'all still with me? St. John chapter 3, 15. St. John chapter 315. Put it up there for me, Jared, real quickly. I'm, I'm going to start the 14th verse. I'm sorry. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. See it? St. John chapter 314. I said 15 at first, but we're going 14 to the 16th verse. Amen. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. Now look at the, the coupling of what the Holy Spirit said. He said, if the son, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. We just read the scripture saying, if, if I be lifted up from the earth, I would draw all men unto me, right? And now Jesus is actually saying, as Moses, he reflects what Moses did in the wilderness when the children of Israel was rebellious against God. He put the serpent on a pole. Now Jesus knows very well the word of God. So he quotes this, watch. And the son, son of man must be lifted up that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then he couples it. For God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why did he repeat it this way? Because he's saying that the love of God reflected on the cross was the only way to evaluate his person. You get Christ as the context, but you get the love as the context as to how to evaluate. 
That's the faith. The devil knows that and he's tricking us. That's why he used love to manipulate. That's why he used faith to manipulate. He knows that all of these are coupled up together. When you look at faith, you're looking at God's perspective. God's perspective is his love because love is the only founding principle on how to truly evaluate. That's why Abraham offered his only son whom he loved. <sighs> okay, just in case it's still not making sense. I know it probably makes sense to you guys. It's, it's something that most folks won't take the time out to evaluate or listen to and really begin to uh, research it out. St. John chapter 5, 39th verse. You heard the scripture before I move faster. 39th verse. St. John chapter 5, 39th verse. Search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. You think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Here, see it? So even if he said, I've did this before. He said, the scriptures testify of me. When I'm lifted up on the cross, it testifies of me. When Moses, as Moses lifted up the, the serpent in the wilderness, it was a point of reference to me. Am I correct in this evaluation? It's an honest, legitimate evaluation. So when I hear Paul says for the preaching of the cross, he's not saying go after the cross as an object of faith. He said it's a point of reference because Jesus already laid the foundation by which we're to look at it. He says when I be lifted up, it's drawing you to me. When, when you look at the serpent of the pole, it's drawing you to me. And when you look at me, you must look through the lens of love because that's the only way to truly evaluate the lamb. And then he says, if you're just not getting it, search the scriptures in them, you think you have eternal life. So just because you can quote scriptures don't mean you have the right context. If I'm not remaining the context of the scriptures, if I'm not the spirit of the prophecy, Rome, Revelation chapter 19, you'll find that. Revelation chapter 19, Jesus is the, the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So everything points to Christ. He says, they are they which testify of me. Why is this important? Because the more we explore and the more we get a revelation of the character and personality of Christ, we get a, person, we get a revelation in the, uh, of the character and personality of God, the Godhead. That's important because this is the dividing line on how to be immune to self-deception as well as outward deception. When you know who you're dealing with, you can't be tricked. You see how all this lining up? Does it make sense? You don't have to be a scholar to get this. The more you know who you're dealing with, you know the handwriting on the wall. Daniel was able to tell them what the handwriting said. You got a lot of Christians don't know God's handwriting. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Listen, I'm the one, he says, that gives you life, but you won't come to me. Why didn't he say you won't come to the cross? So the cross is not meant for us to use as an object of faith. It's meant to have as an object lesson of the faith. I'm finna get there. I promise you. Thank you. You, you seeing it though. That you might have life. He said I receive not honor from men. And that's the point. Men are very much prone to not honor Christ as the highest centerpiece. You ask, answer this question. Just for the sake of argument, would you think this through? Am I safer as a minister to emphasize Christ as the centerpiece and nothing else? Or Christ and something else as the centerpiece. What is the safe haven in that evaluation? What would common sense lead you to? Especially when you have the word reinforcing that fact. Christ and nothing else. His sacrifice is who he is. What he's done is who he is. How he's done it is who he is. It all points to who he is. You understand? When the Holy Spirit comes, and we don't have time, he said he's not going to glorify himself. He's going to glorify me. Why is that important? You say, why is it such a big deal on Christ? Jesus is the word, meaning he's the essence. So God is saying, I want you to see my essence. There's no substitute. There's no additive. Don't take away. Don't add to it. Look at me so you can be immune. 
So I can give you antibodies against the cancer of inward deception. Because the seducing spirits are not always just around you, more particularly they're the things in you. The seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. The doctrines of demons enter in because you're being seduced from me. But I know you, Jesus says, that you have not the love of God in you. He said, this is why you can't see me. Because you're not evaluating through the agape. And I know that about you. <laughs> My Lord, I know you. You're not evaluating. You can't look at the lamb. You can't, those priests in the Old Testament was told to, to cut the skin off and examine and see if there was any uh, diseases inside the, the sheep and, and was there any uh, blemishes inside the sheep and, and it, it was meant as an object lesson it was meant to see to show you that God loves you so much that he allows you to get so personal oh my lord that you can go deep inside to see there's nothing bad about God. There's no malice. There's no malignity. Glory be to God. There's no cancerous or uh, vengeance waiting in the wing somewhere. There's nothing in him that's, uh, that's sneaking around the corner waiting to, to annihilate you. You can examine the lamb and see there's nothing but purity and righteousness. I want you to go inside. Mm. And he said, I know you're not interested in that. Y'all get where we're going? Where we head, doctors of demons and devils. I'm, 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 I'm out of time. I, this thing um, went out. I, I, again, I still ain't scratched the surface. <laughs> I get started. You huh? You <laughs> I do. <laughs> I wish I could, but now you know, only for the truth. But uh, you know, that wouldn't be right either, would it? Well, um, pra Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay. All right. We're going to have to get ready to close out. I, I, again, I, 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 I'm trying to sum up a lot of things that are definitely important. Um, go to 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. I must tie this in because I don't want people leave people hanging. I don't want to sound like this is my opinion. We read out of St. John chapter uh, 3, 14, and 16. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, Excuse me. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, right? I'm going to have to close out on this for the sake of time. Um, we're talking about doctrines of demons, seducing spirits. Again, we got a lot to cover. We're going to have to come back another time to do this. But just to re reinforce some of these thoughts, uh, as we read out of St. John, Jesus says, search the scriptures in them. You think you have eternal life. I didn't get to go to St. John chapter 15 where we kind of quoted it. That he said the Holy Spirit come to glorify me. But you can look at all of that. Even with having a glorified body, it's going to reflect Christ. I think you guys on uh, Thursday read out of what you've been reading out. Behold, uh, what manner of love. Uh, was it uh, uh, first, first John chapter uh, 3, first verse. Behold, what manner of love. And it says, and, and when he appeared, we shall be as he is. See, even in that statement, <laughs> think about the weight of that. It says, all the whole conclusion is when he even appears, even our person going to reflect him. It's going to point back to him. Think, do you understand what we're saying? It's so powerful. It's like you can't get around it. So I know that I'm right in saying that we're not to have the cross as our object of faith because everything should point back to him. Even your resurrected body going to point back to him. You understand? Uh, your walk should point back to him. We're, we're to be represented. We're ambassadors of the earth. Who are we representing? Christ. That's why they call us Christians because we're supposed to be Christ-like, right? So everything. So Jesus even said that the scriptures point to him. His being lifted up on the cross point to him, right? So what I'm saying is the devil is so seductive and the flesh is so seductive, you can take something as legitimate as the cross of Christ and use it as a Trojan horse to misdirect perspective. That is contradictory to God's perspective. He said, no graven images of wood, brass, brass, silver, or gold. As I've said in the Sunday services, and I'm not trying to belitter or criticize 
What I'm saying is verbally irresponsible to assume that because you use the word cross, people will automatically recruit that to you talking specifically about the person and the death of Christ. You can say, yeah, we're talking about his finished work all day long, but when you put the cross, even the term, on a pedestal, the Holy Spirit in all his wisdom didn't see to do that. He didn't see that fit to do that. The, the word cross is only mentioned 28 times in the whole Bible. And it's only in the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, it was a point of reference, as it was all the animals. Remember, Zeke Jeffrey said it, and I said, I hope he's going to walk it through. See, the Holy Spirit wants me to pick up on things like this. I don't have the physical capacity to do that. How can I hear you two weeks later and still remember it? That's the Lord. You understand? Um, you made the statement that the, all the animals, you, you, you stopped your wife and you said, let's go back. And we was listening to some of it coming here. You stopped your wife and you said um, that, uh, notice that God said in these sacrifices, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, are uh, the blood and sheep are good and God was not well pleased. You emphasized, the Holy Spirit wanted that. And he brought to my memory and brought to my spirit a strong truth that you was trying to convey and that you were conveying. The, because the sacrifices of the animals and bull and goats not just because they was uh, uh, not able to wash us away from sin, that wasn't the only reason, but they were only a point of reference. Everybody would agree they were symbolic. To There was a shadow to what was come. They were meant to as an object lesson. Am I correct in saying it? Now think of the, think of the truth of it. Let me walk you through it because my time, again, I keep saying it. But let's walk through it. These are living creatures that God was not well pleased in seeing them sacrifice. They were not inanimate things. They were animated things. Blood of the innocent animals and sheep and goats. And he said he wasn't well pleased with those sacrifices. And did he never ever even thought to say, put your faith in that symbol. He never said, shift your uh, the to the common Christ plus the sacrifice of the animals. He never told them to put their faith in the altar that the animals were sacrificed on. Now how is it that we have the fulfillment of the word, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the death of the true Lamb of God, and yet we compare this cross with him? When the scripture says don't do so, how can I prove that? First King, Second King chapter 18, first verse, y'all with me? And I don't have time for the sake of time. This is Hezekiah. We're going to start at the third verse, Jared. Second uh, King chapter 18. Run out of time as you can hear. Second King chapter 18, third verse. Just in case you ask, well, why do your time? If you live by the Spirit, just keep going. And I used to think like that. And I understand. And, I, and I'm not even in, uh, in uh, um, disagreement necessarily with not worrying about the time. I actually would prefer to keep going forward. But something the Lord has showed me that I think is extremely important is considering as to what we're saying it has such substance and in my opinion and such gravity to it I can't be overly concerned about how much information that I put out there how much revelation that the Lord may give us to bring forth our concern is the quality of those who are listening to be able to walk away and have something when you get so caught up in how much you can put out instead of uh, being a servant as to who you're serving then you missed the mark. And I have missed that mark many times over. So if you're wondering about the time span that we try to come, unless the Lord say differently and push me to go further, I would do so. But I just want to bring balance. That's why we do this. Because I'm more concerned about your hearing it and, and having quality time than in just having quantity time. Amen. So I hope you get that. Uh, third verse. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all David his father did. He removed the high places and broke the images and cut down the groves. The groves, as Sister Jeffrey Well said, and we hadn't even been able to echo her much on a lot of great truths that the Lord has brought through her and keep doing the great work and bringing those truths and the definitions. I think that helps a whole lot. Um, and you too as well, Deacon Jeffrey, you guys keep doing a great job and, and as you're doing. But let me say this. <clears throat> um, the groves represents trees that were used as a covering. And she's made the statement many times over, and we're going to keep emphasizing they were prophets of the groves. 
prophets of the trees. The first thing Adam and Eve did was hide behind the trees. And I, again, I know I may be seeming like I'm making much out of, uh, of the tree, but there's a whole lot there we can't explain right now in this short segment. You know the scripture says, curse is the man that trusts in the arms of flesh. And it also says, curse is the man who hang on the tree. I've said this many times, and the Lord revealed this to us. The tree represents us. And I'm repeating this. It represents us. So curse is the man that hangeth on or trusts in man. When Christ hung on the cross, he became a curse for us. Not that he was trusting in man, but he trusted God enough to stand in front of man, to redeem man. Amen. And therefore were pronounced cursed, that all curses can be broken. The great curse of humanity is self-dependence. It's the underlying curse of all curses, Amen. depending on self. And so Hezekiah is called to cut down the groves. So if you think it through, he goes to cut down the trees by which these altars and images were hiding behind. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> you get it? You see, the trees were hiding the abominations, the deception, the seduction, the enchantments, the, the deviations. The trees were hiding it. And he's being called of God as a servant of God, as a prophet of God, as a king of God. He cut down the hiding place. He didn't just take down the images, but he cut down that which they were hiding behind. When God calls you and there's a real word from the Lord, you not only cut down the images, the abominations, but you cut down the things that are hiding it. That's why the Lord's given us to pronounce to the world. And it might be small right now. We're being censored and, and other people are trying to stop this voice because there's demons behind. They know what the weight of what we're saying is, is, is just what it is. It really is. What the Lord has done in our life is to say cut down not only the groves. And, I mean not only the images and the idols and the, and the fake worship and the, and the fake faith and the fake loves and the fake commitments. But cut down that which is hiding behind the trees. And most Christians can't see the forest for the trees. Mm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Mm. He said, and he broke in pieces the brazen serpent, brass serpent that Moses had made. Doesn't that sound familiar? For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and it is called... And, and, had, and he had called it Neshatan, if I'm not pronouncing it right. Nehushtan, Nehushtan, thank you. Which means piece of copper. Originally, the brazen serpent was set up by God as a symbol of the coming redeeming of Calvary, redemption of Calvary. Isn't that wonderful? That's absolutely right, right? But to prove, to prom but so prone is the heart of idolatry to the Holy Spirit records here the action of Hezekiah with approval. Likewise, many in the modern church have made idols of water, baptism, Lord's Supper, and particular religious denomination, etc. I like to add to that list the cross. Oh, see, see, we don't think about that, though. See how subtle that is? Now, why, why are you saying that, Pastor Harris? When Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, do you not know that Jesus knew this scripture? He knew that Israel worshipped the serpent on the pole. But yet he point as a reference to when Moses had the serpent on the pole, knowing that if person is really interested in his person, they would know not to do the same thing that Israel did with the serpent on the pole and turn around and worship the very cross that he's going to die on. Mm. And we did exactly that. We're hiding behind the tree. Because the context is lost. And it needs to be cut down. Not to, this is not to demean the cross, even a little run. But it's symbolic. If it doesn't point us back to Christ, then it's blinding. Can you prove that? One more and I am. Y'all can turn there, Jerry. You don't have. You can put it on the screen. You guys don't have to turn there. But I'm going to prove it real quick and close. And you, you're already familiar with this passage of scripture. I, uh, I just got to do this one, and we'll, we'll let it go. Um, there's so much to actually deal to really validate this point. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
2 Corinthians chapter 3. So I, I, what I've done and trying to do as we deal with seducing spirits and doctrines, the devil is trying to give you a baseline by which all doctrines of deceptions and enchantment are about. They're about getting us away from the person of Christ. They're about getting us away from the exploration or, the, to, or should I say the evaluation of who Christ is. That's the only way to actually know true doctrine that comes from God. There's no other, other way. And, and frankly, your prayer life changes when, when this occurs. You can be a very prayerful person uh, and very sensitive to the spirit, and people will only know this, if you will allow us, when, when God rewards you openly. When they, when they see how you live, how you talk, how you communicate. You got folks that be around you don't even know the depths of what your relationship looks like until until they themselves get invested. They will take for granted the depths that God wants to do in their own lives because the investment is so little. And so they can't recognize the letter. They know something is there, but they really can't see. That's why Israel didn't know their visitation. Think about, I'm not exaggerating. Think about, you can't get none, no more holier than Christ. You can't get no more righteous than Christ. You can't get no more powerful than Jesus, filled without measure with the Holy Spirit, and yet they missed it. Why? Because their own investment was of little use, of little importance. You got a lot of people like that. The most loneliest person in the world is the person who's truly committed with, to God, surrounded by half-hearted believers. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> Y'all still with us? Amen. I'm going to read the 14th verse. But their minds were blinded. For unto this day, I'm, I'm, I'm talk, it's talking about Israel, I just don't have time. Unto this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. For you who are looking on, think about what I'm saying. So I'm not making this up, not trying to make something say what it doesn't say. This is why when you're sitting in a church and they're preaching anything higher or as a priority other than learning Christ, this is why this, this, this message, it, it, you can use this message to teach your children in Sunday school. You can use this message. This message fits everybody. It's meat and milk at the same time. Think about what I'm saying. It's universal. You don't have to be some kind of uh, great articulate theologian. Once you find the context, once you find the clarity, it, 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 it can, you can talk to a five-year-old and still minister to them with these exact same words because now the emphasis is on Christ. It's verbally irresponsible to point people to anything other than emphasis on examining the Lamb. John the Baptist, he, Jesus said he was the greatest prophet of them all. And he said, behold the lamb. Amen. That, 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 that's not going to change. Your name is written in the lamb's book of life. Not the cross. Not the finished word. Even though these principles, these symbols, these acts of Christ himself are of extreme extreme important but they will go over your head when the person of Christ is exempt from your evaluation and what happens is the mind is blinded the conscious and that's a gateway for seduction and doctrines of demons and it remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which Veil is done away with in Christ. In the no, he didn't say Jesus. Why didn't he say Jesus? Done away with in Jesus. Jesus means Savior. Why did he say Christ? Because Christ, the word Christ, the Christ, is anointed one. Anointed means influence. It doesn't just mean like the oil over the head or this, the the goosebumps you feel and, the, and the, 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 the unction that you feel to do something. When he used the word the Christ he says it's done away in the influence under the influence of the person of God. You're under the influence. You're persuaded. So now you have an immune system, antibodies, a 
against the veil. But even unto this day, Moses is read. When Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. That's why when people get into um, Israel, 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 Hebrew lights and all this stuff, they're trying to keep the law, it's because they don't have Christ as the celebrant. That's why you get tricked. That's why you create denominations. That's why you get into uh, celebrating uh, communion because it's going to translate into Christ's literal blood and flesh. All this stuff is a mess because Christ is not the center. That's why you don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the first evidence in speaking in tongue because you think it's about the tongue when the tongue is an emphasis on the person of Christ. He takes away your babble. So the tongues are there to say if I control your tongue, I can control your heart. You caught up on water. Water saves. You see, that's because you're ignoring the evaluation of the lamb. And your evaluation is not through the lens of love. Therefore, you're deceived by the master of deception and endorsed by demons. Been there. Done it. My passion eats me because I know what we're saying is not only important but it is essential between the line drawn between death and life. But even when Moses is read, it, the veil is on their heart. Nevertheless, when it, is, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now where the Spirit of the Lord is, there, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is. There is. See, I'm stopping there for on purpose. There is. You can't, see, if you don't feel the liberty, if you're not experiencing the liberty, that means something's off. Liberty. Because it turns to the Lord. And the Spirit came to glorify Christ. The Word is there to glorify Christ. Okay, thank you for joining us. Lot said, Lot trying to get across, but I promise you that if you realize that Christ is the center of it all and you realize that Christ and his sacrifice is to draw us closer as an amplifier to evaluation who he is through love, it's a game changer. In game. You don't even have to worry about fighting confusion anymore you don't have to worry about being in the boxing ring with doubt everything that is not like Christ becomes more easily discernible your prayer life changes you're not praying to the air anymore you're not trying to pray to sound sensitive but you know God hears you because now the reality of God settles in on you because he guarantees that would happen by his spirit because now you're in harmony with his mind. Faith. Let this mind be in you. That's what it's talking about. And Hezekiah understood it. He understood that even the legitimate symbol as a brazen altar or brass serpent on a pole or an animal sacrifice could be hid by the devil with trees in the groves use as Trojan horses to kidnap your understanding but God I got good news God is coming your way to set you free from that which has caused confusion amen God bless you thank you for joining us <clears throat> hallelujah bless his name Thank you for joining us. Lord's willing, we'll see you next week. Stay tuned to our Bible studies. If you would stay with me real quickly, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the free flow of your spirit in this place and in our hearts and in our souls. Lord, we do not even trust in our own hearts. We trust in the heart of God. As your servant David is and was, he was a man after your own heart. Help us to be men and women after your own heart because it is your heart that matters. It's your mind that matters. It's your judgment that matters that keeps us safe from the cancer of self-deception. Thank you for this great revelation, this truth. 
that we may have the love of God abounding in us more and more growing in the knowledge of grace and truth of our Lord Jesus Christ and this we pray amen amen God bless you God bless you Godspeed Hallelujah.